Like you, I too often visit the used car websites to check just how much some incredible premium cars have depreciated. Oh look, a Bentley for less than $15,000. Should I buy it? I bet it'll make me look so cool. Oh, yeah. Wrong, it would make me go broke. Hey everyone, new guy Ian here covering for Stipe to bring you seven cheap cars that will bankrupt you fast. Let's go. Number seven. Believe it or not, the DB7 was an entry level model, which was reflected in its price, as well as the parts being used to build it. This irresistibly seductive ass shared a lot of mechanicals with the Jags, as old as the ancient XJS. Most buttons, switches, and electrics came from Ford, taillights were from a Mazda, and side mirrors from a Citroen. Now I know what you're thinking, cheap to buy with cheap replacement parts. But is it though? Despite being a model that saved Aston Martin from going bankrupt, you can watch that video later, <clears throat> link is in the description, for you, a used DB7 will spell financial doom. Relatively cheap examples do exist, but those will almost certainly come with a bucket full of expensive problems. The borrowed parts that I mentioned are easy to come by, but those few parts that are bespoke Aston will still come with an Aston's price tag. Like the crappy aircon, the exhaust system which is prone to cracking, or all the body panels that are made of specialized materials. You'll also need to find a specialist mechanic who knows how to work on these cars, and they too are rare and pricey. In short, buying a cheap used DB7 is a lot like dating Amber Turd. Pretty, but sooner or later, you'll want it out of your life. Preferably before it shits on your driveway. Best to stay away from it. Number 6. I remember when this thing came out. Yes, I'm that old, shut up! And man, was it something! Those beautifully rounded headlights, the sexy silhouette, silky smooth V12, and of course the origami metal folding roof, which made it a real two-in-one car. The new SL was a proper GT coupe, or at the press of a button, an exciting roadster. Who would want a car with a flappy tent stretched over your head when this exists? Plus, it's a Mercedes. Now, 20 years later, you can find this glorious car for less than $15,000, to which I would say, run, run and don't look back. If the appetite of a twin turbo V12 won't bankrupt you, then the maintenance surely will. The R230 SL was incredibly unreliable. That roof alone is made of 1 million moving parts, of which any can fail. Here's a list of the common issues just for the roof. Then there are problems with the suspension, the, for the time, futuristic gizmos, and overall build quality. Wait, aren't Mercs famous for quality? <laughs> the rumor is, by the 1990s, Mercedes was making such reliable and well-made cars that their replacement parts business started to lose them money. So instead, they loosened the quality control a bit. A bit too much. The result was this. In 1994, Mercedes was first in JD Power Customer Satisfaction Survey. Ten years later, they were ninth. From the bottom. So you still want the most expensive Mercedes from that period? Didn't think so. Number 5. I'm sure you're familiar with the Phaeton, VW's attempt at making a better car than the big Merc, the big Lex, and the ugly BMW. And you know what? It was better. In engineering terms, Phaeton was head and shoulders above any other car in its class, but in order to sell well in that class, it needed more than just incredible mechanics. It needed the right badge, too. Luxury cars are about being prestigious, setting yourself apart from the common folks, and those crisscross V letters on the grill were doing anything but. That's why its value sank faster than the Titanic, to the point that these days you can find the maxed out W12 model for less than $4,000. Like this one here. Notice how it's a bit of a lowrider? That means the air suspension had gone kaput, and fixing that will cost you more than you paid for the car. Okay, like the Aston, the Phaeton also shares some components with other cars too, except in this case they were all more expensive. I'm talking Audi A8 and the Bentley Flying Spur. But even if you find a good one, it won't be cheap to keep it in that shape. There's this Swiss guy who did a full breakdown video on how much it costs to run a Phaeton W12 for four years, including servicing, depreciation, and fuel. The final number was $73,500. What? That cannot be right. If a car is too expensive for a Swiss person, then what chance could you possibly have? Number 4. I'm gonna go against the theme of this video and say buy this car! Seriously, if you can find a good deal, go for it. Just don't drive it. Ever. 
What am I talking about? Well, this particular generation of the M5 is the most special super saloon ever made, and it is only a matter of time before the prices start going up. True, the newer models are faster and better and all, but this is the only one that came with a V10 engine that is closely related to the V10 found in a Formula 1 car, and it sounds like this. That engine is also the reason why these cars can be found so cheap today. It has a habit of destroying the rod bearings like they're made of chinesium, and when those go, well, let me paint a picture. After you buy the E60 M5, a sort of countdown will begin. Maybe a year or so later, maybe a week, maybe tomorrow, when you're going for a drive in Santa Fe, Manhattan, Prague, wherever, listening to that sweet noise, feeling like you're in automotive heaven, You'll hear a scrape under the hood, and before you know it, BAM, the whole engine falls apart. At that point, it's best to scrap the whole car. Oh, and the automatic SMG gearbox has a ton of issues too, none of which are cheap to fix. So buy it, let it grow in value, just don't drive it or it might explode. Number 3. If you're a student looking for a cool car, the Mazda RX-8 will seem like a gift from the gods themselves. It's sporty, surprisingly practical with those clever rear doors, and the prices of used ones dip as low as $1,000. Amazing! It even has a small 1.3 liter engine, which should be good for fuel economy. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no. Like that girl from Thailand, the tiny engine found in an RX-8 is not what it seems to be. It's a wanker, wankle, a wankle engine, which instead of cylinders has this spinning triangle, the Dorito. That makes it light and revvy, which is good for sporty cars, but it uses too much fuel, and due to its inherent flaw, it uses a lot of oil too. Doesn't last long either. Here's why. As the Dorito rotates, it goes through the usual ICE operations. Suck, squeeze, bang, and blow. It is very important to keep these chambers, where the cycles occur, separated. You don't want the fuel to leak out elsewhere. And that's what these apex seals are for. As they scrape along the insides, the engine is constantly being flooded by oil to keep them from wearing out. But they still do, every 30,000 miles or so. And then you lose power, you have misfires, the car starts to run worse than Stephen Hawking, basically the engine needs to go out, get taken apart, and have the seals replaced. It's not a cheap thing to do. And the $1,000 RX-8 will probably need to have that done ASAP. So just, just don't, okay? Number 2. Ah, the Maserati Quattroporte, the poster boy of making all the wrong decisions in life. On paper, it sounds good. Pininfarina styling, an F1 transmission, and a Ferrari engine, which in real life sounds even better. When new, these Quattroportes were going for over $100,000 and up to $140, but seeing how cheap they are now, I get why you'd be tempted. But before you even imagine yourself in this four-door Ferrari, let's read some owner's reviews, shall we? <laughs> Looks good, but a hunk of junk. Not reliable or even close to it. Or this one, clutch lasts 20,000 miles, $2,500 to fix. Worst quality ever. This poor guy had pretty much everything go wrong with it. Another one, dangerous car. Gas pedal got stuck for the third time. Okay, that's not funny anymore. All in all, the Quattroporte is a wonderful car, when it works. But when it doesn't, which is most of the time, the owners will just want to find a sucker who'll get it off their hands. Don't be that sucker. Funny thing, Maserati invested a lot of money to make the next model more reliable, but still, it ended up dead last in the customer satisfaction. A lot of improvements, and still last. If that doesn't tell you how bad the big ol' Maza was, nothing will. Number 1. Car reviewers will often describe the Range Rover as an off-road Mercedes S-Class. Maximum luxury, hugely prestigious, and pretty much unstoppable when the going gets rough. Most owners, however, will describe them as complete junk. Know your f***ing place, trash. Naturally, this is not something you'll hear when they try and sell it to you. But ignore the sweet talk and think, man, think. Why are Land Rovers always finishing last in reliability reports? Why is the reputation of bad quality costing the company 100,000 sales per year? Why do Land Rover jokes exist? Yes, that's a thing. 
Clearly, the only people who buy Range Rovers are the ones that have more dollars than cents, and they'll go for new or slightly used ones. You know, the ones that are still covered by warranty. Without it, the price drops to just a fraction of the original MSRP, and you can literally find hundreds of them. But as cool as they may look, beware. The average maintenance and repair bills will amount to over $9,000 per year. In most cases, that's more than what the car is worth. Imagine buying a used Range Rover, and then buying another one each year until you go broke. That's like the definition of insanity. Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? Still, it's not like you'd be much better off with these three honorable mentions. Can you guess them? Is your car expensive to maintain? Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you in the next one.